Welcome, my name's Rob and I'm gonna to react to the Tasman Bridge disaster of 1975. I need to find out what happened. We begin our story in the city of Hobart, Tasmania, Australia, in the 1940s. The city is one of the most populous regions on the Australian island state of Tasmania. Hobart straddles the estuary of the River Derwent where the city extends along both sides. Needless to say, this requires methods to cross from one side to the other. Much like other cities built along a river, ferry services and bridges supply the demand to travel from either the east or west of the city. The suburb of Clarence in the eastern side of the Derwent had developed at a much slower pace than the western city and its suburbs. Originally, the city had a bridge built in 1830, roughly 20 kilometres upstream from the eastern shore's suburbs. This led to a lopsided development of the city's major population centres. In 1942, Hobart and its suburbs had a population of 65,000 on the western shore, and in comparison to Clarence on the east, that only had around 4,400. Cool. Isn't it amazing how... Uh, the infrastructure such as bridges and roads can massively affect how population growth takes place. And in this case, yeah, the figures speak for themselves. Because of this, in 1943, the city gained a new crossing, a floating arch bridge with a lift span near the western wow. shore. This would spark major population growth in the eastern suburbs of the city, which would triple between 1943 and 1964, from 4,400 to about 28,000. The rather limiting and not particularly permanent looking float bridge was looked to be replaced in the 1960s. A floating bridge, uh, that doesn't seem very practical, especially when it is on water that goes up and down. Um, uh, it, that's awesome images to see, though. Really, really cool images to see from back then, from that height and distance, that floating long bridge. Um, but certainly doesn't sound very practical. So I can certainly understand why they needed a proper bridge. This led to the Tasman Bridge, a four lane span built next to its predecessor. Due to this bigger bridge, population on the east side exploded, yet again jumping from 28,000 to over 40,000 in just 10 years. However, eventually, the city would have to rely solely on its bridge as the local government funding for ferry services dried up, forcing commuters onto the roads. By the early 1970s, as many as 25,000 cars crossed over the Tasman Bridge every day. I just want to point out the fact about ferries. We've got a very similar situation um, in the fact that ferries are used uh, in Southampton, where up close to where I'm from. And Southampton sort of splits um, and the Solent comes in. But what you've got, you've got Hyde on one side and you've got Netley on the other side. And people don't want to go up through the centre of Southampton and, and, and down to Netley. So there is a ferry service that takes you across. But the problem is with ferries is, and yes, you sort of get this with bridges as well, but more in the case of ferries where high winds can't, can't go, bad weather can't go. Um, so ferries are very unreliable, in my opinion, for these sort of crossings. Making the crossing essential for the east side's population. Now let's take a look at the specs of the Tasman Bridge. With the float bridge being a bit long in the tooth, the new Tasman Bridge was conceived to provide a 24-hour connection, not requiring traffic to stop like it did for the original lift section to open for shipping. The £7 million bridge consisted of 21 spans supported by 10-foot wide reinforced concrete columns with a 350-foot wide navigational span between pier numbers 14 and 15. This meant shipping was intended to pass closer to the eastern bank of the river. Please don't tell me a ship didn't go through that gap and just went straight through one of the smaller gaps or just piled straight into one of the, one of the pillars. To support the piers, piles were driven into the riverbed. One set under Pier 7 was the deepest in Australia. The bridge measured at 4,650 feet with a waterway width of 3,500 feet. The bridge deck 
was 57 feet wide, which accommodates four lanes of traffic and two walkways. Construction ran from April 1960 to December 1964, with the first ship passing under the construction in August 1964, although the bridge actually had its official opening on Thursday the 18th of March 1965. The bridge would serve the city well for 10 years, allowing the eastern side to grow into a larger and larger suburban area. The bridge became essential in stitching the two sections of the city together, but just under 10 years after its official opening, a section of the bridge would fall. How good is this old footage? It's not easy on the eyes to look at, but it's awesome to see what it was and the types of cars and things that were on the road back then um, going over this bridge and what it really looked like. A disaster. The harbour at Hobart is one of the deepest in the world, and this influenced the Tasman Bridge's design with its navigational span. This, needless to say, meant that shipping was a common sight along the Derwent River. Both commercial shipping and cruise ships make their way under the bridge. One such vessel was the Lake Illawarra, a bulk carrier. She weighed in at 7,274 gross registered tonnes and 10,380 tonnes dead weight measuring in with a length of 139 metres, or 458 feet, with a beam of 18 metres, or 59 feet. The handy-sized classified vessel has a top speed of 12.5 knots, roughly 14 miles an hour, delivered by its single-prop steam turbine-powered driveline. She was in her second decade of service Very slow, in 1970, miles an hour. being launched in 1958, and was an Australian-built and operated vessel. She is a regular sight along the Derwent, and on the evening of the 5th of January 1975, uh -oh. the vessel is navigating along the river towards the Tasman Bridge. This evening, her destination is upstream from the city of Hobart, the Risdon Zinc Works refinery in Lutana, Tasmania, and she has a complement of 42 crew aboard. She is carrying 10,000 tonnes of zinc ore concentrate, which is probably pretty handy given her destination. In command this evening is 60-year-old Captain... Bolslaw Pelk, with Robert Bank, age 45, on the helm, making steering adjustments under the captain's orders. The Lake Illawarra by 9pm is roughly 1,300 metres, just over 1,400 yards from the Tasman Bridge. Captain Pelk, after seeing there was no traffic on the river, ordered full shipping speed from the engine room, which would bring the vessel up to roughly 8 knots. Although picking up speed, the ship wasn't acting as it should. The Lake Illawarra started to move off course towards foul ground and shallow water. Pelk, seeing this, ordered a turn to starboard, but this didn't fix the problem. The ship was not in line with the bridge markers, which were there to guide ships through the opening. Bank received another order, steer due north, but the bow swung quickly, but it was not enough. Steer to 101, Pelk ordered. He was trying to line up the ship with the channel at the same time as trying to correct the swing. But this quite drastic adjustment swung the ship far to starboard. All of these movements were ordered whilst the ship was at full shipping speed. By now the distance to the bridge had almost halved. Stop engines, ordered Pelk. I assume that, um, and I'm thinking about the Titanic for example, in, in a big vessel like this, it must be so difficult to change directions and change speed. Because... You know, you haven't got the friction on the ground and, and you're relying on the propellers and things. Um, so the difficulty, if he was going off course, the ability to then get back. Ugh, I can only imagine. I, I can only imagine how um, difficult it would have been to fix it and actually how difficult it possibly would have been to even stop. You know, if you're going in the wrong direction at full speed, what you think was going to be in the right direction to start off with and all of a sudden you're not, how easy is it to bring that size vessel to a halt? I don't know. I don't think it would be very easy, especially with how deep the, the water is there. Banks turned hard to port, but the Lake Illawarra continued to the bridge. At 300 metres, roughly 350 yards, Pelk ordered the engine room to put the engines full astern. But still the Lake Illawarra advanced. Panic, Pelk ordered double full astern, then dropped both anchors, quickly followed with triple full astern. 
but it was too late. The ship was on a crash course to the bridge. With the port anchor dropped and the engines astern, the bow turned starboard. The ship slapped into the bridge. Meanwhile, Captain Pelk and Banks had thought they had, although having hit the bridge, not hit it too hard. Banks even said, thank God it didn't hit hard. But the bridge's fate was sealed. The roadway above had cracked. The electrical wiring that was used to connect the two parts of Hobart was sparking in the evening sky. Soon enough, the realisation on the ship's bridge was that a collapse was imminent and would result in tons of concrete landing on the ship. 7,000 tons of roadway and concrete crashed onto the ship. The ship, with the impact of the bridge and now extra weight, began to sink. She momentarily settled on the riverbed, only to continue her descent as her weight of cargo pulled her down. Some crew started jumping overboard, but disaster was not only aboard the Lake Illawarra, but also on the Tasman Bridge. On the bridge. I want to know, I hope it, it does explain, but I would love to know what was going on with the river to make the ship not do as, as what the captain wanted, because... I'm sure the captain is ex- would have been experienced and would know what he was doing, but something caught him out. Darkness had consumed a crossing, and four cars could be seen from the river's oh, banks, man. headlight on, falling from the bridge into the water's all-consuming obscurity. Frank Manley and his family were making the crossing. As they went over the peak of the bridge, Manley slowed to what he thought was a broken-down car. His wife shouted, look, the bridge is gone. Manley slammed on the brakes of his Holden Monaro. The first two wheels went over the cliff edge that had now formed on the bridge. The car became beach teetering on the edge of darkness. In a bizarre stroke of luck, he and his family had narrowly avoided death. But just look at how close he was. Murray Ling and his family managed to stop before the edge, but was rear-ended, pushing his car also onto the broken section. Luckily, his old Holden station wagon too did not topple down to the river. As many of the sailors bobbed in the water, one question hit them. What about the engine crew? These poor people had no warning issued to them. It would be later discovered that the engine room telegraph still read for the stern. Emergency response was swift. Many had seen the ship crash into the bridge from the shore. Some locals using small boats raced to the crash scene and recovered many of the ship's crew. By morning, the full scale of the disaster became apparent. Multiple witnesses had reported up to 10 cars had gone off the bridge. The police in the morning would say, we can only rely on reports about who had not arrived home by late night. Three unsupported spans and a 127 metre section of roadway had disappeared under the collapse. I just look at that image. Uh, my word. I, the two cars that it was talking about, they really are teetering on, on the edge there. And... You see this in in films and movie, uh, you know, in movies and, uh, and and TV shows, don't you? Where you know a car is on the edge of a cliff, and it's and you've got to almost don't move. This actually happened. My, I, I just want to like for them. I, I just wonder what what they were what was going through their heads, and obviously the people that actually drove off. Oh my word! What a disaster! Although disastrous, luckily due to the time of day and the fact that it was a Sunday, more vehicles were not involved. Over the coming days, police divers located and recovered four vehicles, as well as undertaking a comprehensive survey of the wreck of the Lake Illawarra on the 13th of January. In total, 12 had died, 7 aboard the ship and 5 from the cars. The city was split in two, and with 12 dead and millions of dollars of damage caused, a big question hovered over the disaster. And that was how and why. The investigation. Witnesses and survivors were painstakingly questioned and their stories corroborated. Engineers were asked for their opinion on the bridge's design. The piers, either side of the main shipping channel, had been designed to withstand a blow from a 20,000 tonne ship travelling at 9 knots. But no other pier on the bridge had been strengthened to withstand a blow from a passing ship. Ah, oh, that's that's rough. So obviously the, the middle ones that, that the ship is meant to go through, they are reinforced and, and they've got the strength possibly to take a light blow. 
but none of the others do. And unfortunately, the ship hit them. It would make the cost of such a bridge prohibitive, engineers said. A maritime court of inquiry started on the 30th of January 1975 and investigated the collision. It would slam the crew, but mainly Captain Pelk. They found that the ship went out of control about two ship lengths, or roughly 300 metres, just over 300 yards from the bridge. Due to the number of turns, the ship was going too slow and had lost its steerage way. The inquiry found Pelk at fault and suspended his licence for six months. He was quoted as saying, I'm eager to get back to the sea. I have been at sea for 40 years and it has always been a cruel sea. No matter what people say, it's a tough profession. But this wasn't going to be the case. a and the ship's operator, quietly retired Pelk in November 1975. Aftermath. After salvage being ruled out, the ship would stay sunk just below the bridge, although parts would be cut away for repair works on the bridge later on. The city would experience a drastic change in the way its suburbs experienced the region, with extended journey times and desperate for the little ferry services that ran across the river. The eastern suburbs became more independent post-disaster, as the detour using the older bridge to the north added several hours to a round trip. In March 1975, a joint Tasman Bridge Restoration Commission was appointed to rebuild the Tasman Bridge. In October, plans began. It would not only restore the crossing, but also add an additional lane. The two halves of the city would be reunited with a temporary bridge opened a year after the disaster. But Hobart would have to wait in total two years to see the Tasman Bridge rebuilt, being completed in October 1977. Well, one big implementation post-disaster was the use of pilots. Although not foolproof, the Sunshine Skyway would have a lot to say about that, it is definitely an improvement in safety. This is a plain difficult production. All videos on the channel are... Wow. Um, what? That... It's awful. Uh, you've got to... Well, obviously, you've got to feel for the cars that went off because it's it would have come out of nowhere and, and it was... The bridge just collapsed and they went down and... Just... I don't even know what to think. I really don't know what to think how disastrous it was for those people how close to the the two cars those two families could have gone in um i almost i almost that six months suspended you know license with a with basically a retirement is almost feels like a bit of a slap in the face to the people that died if if the captain was really to blame wow um i didn't know anything like this had happened uh over in in relaxed tasmania but Clearly it has. Oh, fascinating. I hope you enjoyed it as well. Um, the Tasman Bridge up and running again now, I assume. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure you like and subscribe and I'll catch you next time.